between seniors' daughters, correct? So um, it was an open secret in Montgomery at the time. In fact, it later came out that Hank Sr., before he died, had signed something close to a custody agreement with the mother of Kathy, where he, he uh, made assurances and promises that he would care for the child financially and really with custody for much of her child life. And a side note, apparently desired by the mother who was not married to Hank, that he would pay for a one-way ticket for her to go to California upon the birth of the child. Well, Hank died on July, January 1, 1953, in the back seat of a Cadillac going to a gig in Ohio. Most of you know that story if you're here from Montgomery. And she was born five days later in St. Margaret's Hospital. And because of those, that known arrangement, Hank's mother took care of Kathy, brought her into the house and cared for her, but she got sick, and she died a couple of years later. And nobody else in the family was either willing or thought it was a good idea to bring her in. And so arrangements were made with the state that she becomes essentially what it, something close to a ward of the state at the time. They put her in a home put her up for adoption, sorry. And she went into a series of foster homes until at age six, she's adopted by a family in Mobile. She later went to the University of Alabama. She knew nothing, she was real so young when she was with her mother, she knew nothing about her heritage until just through a, a, some coincidental events when she's at University of Alabama, about 21, when she becomes aware of who her father was. She ultimately met this lawyer who helped her dig into the underlying facts of the case, and that brings them to Montgomery in our offices. And I didn't work on the matter, but kind of had an opportunity to talk with her now, deal with her, and I was acquainted with some of the things that happened later. So they went to court. Now, she ultimately won in 1989 in a Supreme Court, Alabama Supreme Court case. But Hank, this will not surprise you, Hank Williams didn't die with a will. He died without a will. And in circuit court, she lost. And the, the reason she lost at the circuit lower court level is the judge said, well, um, at the state of Alabama law, when you were born, and when Hank's estate was litigated up, up from 1953 to 1975 when he closed, was that a child born out of wedlock could only inherit from their mother without will, not the father. In some ways, they weren't considered the child of the father born out of wedlock. And besides that, you were adopted several years later, and your parents never even sought to pursue this. So too much time has passed, and the law at this time didn't recognize you, so you're the daughter, but you have no inheritance. That was the ruling. Now, the Supreme Court said, well, you know, the U.S. Supreme Court said those types of provisions constitute, uh, Adam, invidious discrimination just on the basis of whether your parents were married, and we're not going to allow that anymore in the country. So, so after the estate had been closed in 75, the law changed, and the Alabama Supreme Court basically restated the law in a way that uh, changed that. And the Alabama Supreme Court said, yeah, and had you raised this then, we probably would have changed the law back then because the U.S. Supreme Court had told us that. And besides, this second adoption thing, that made no difference because... When she was born, when Hank died, she was born, her birthright was established at birth. And besides, there had been some fraud in the administration of this estate, and people concealed this from the court. The record had been sealed, and most of the people knew she was out there, and you had an obligation to do more to make sure that she could claim her inheritance and enforce her rights. So ultimately, she won. She goes by, the, as you know, the 
stage name of Jet Williams. She lives in Nashville. Uh, her first husband died, and she's remarried now. I haven't seen her since. But I thought about that story when we got to this passage in the fourth chapter of Galatians, because it encompasses everything we're going to talk about today. Adoption, what it means to be a child, a birthright, um, uh, inheritance, and worldly forces, secular forces, that tend to obscure our ability or desire or capability of walking in and enjoying our inheritance. But I hope that this will trigger stories on your part too because, you know, Paul can be a hard person to understand at times. And some of these classes have been somewhat academic. You know, we've got volumes of books on Paul at our house. You can read as much of this as you want to read. You know, and Andrew started off with a good expo exposition on the new perspective of Paul versus the historic perspective of Paul. Paul, we have the two books that are suggested reading this, one from John Stott, the historic perspective, another by N.T. Wright, the new perspective. And some of his writing is dense, and you can get into the context, and you can just read to your heart's delight. But I'm reminded, Eloise, earlier in our marriage, used to say if she couldn't sleep at night, she would turn to me and say, tell me about that biography that you're reading these days because it can get kind of boring and dry. And as Alan said today, the Bible is more than that. I mean, God wants to engage our spirit, our emotions, our experiences, and Paul does that some. He uses similes, he uses metaphors, he uses comparisons that are to provoke our understanding of Scripture in a way that we wouldn't otherwise do it. And chapter 4 lends itself to that in particular here. So that's why this, this class is going to be a little bit different. We're going to reserve more time in the back side of the class for interaction uh, from you. And I've listed some of the questions that hopefully we're going to talk about, and hopefully you'll have other ideas. I'm also reminded that we have a property law expert here who probably is also an expert in Roman law, the 12 tablets, the Roman code. And so um, anything that uh, I hope that Adam will pitch in as this case, as this class goes forward. But I, I tell you, I'm 65 years old. Half the time I go to church, I don't know if you're like this, but I'm worried about something else. You know, we get a call from a child, you know, in the morning, and we're talking about it on the way here. When our kids were younger, just getting the kids here was, ah. And then you're mad at everybody when you arrive, you know? So half the time, I'm there. But when my head is screwed on right, uh, I'm always yearning for an aha moment at church. It could be in the sermon. Sometimes it's in the music. Uh, sometimes it's at communion. Uh, sometimes it's in a class. And a lot of times it's what people like you say in response. All of a sudden, something breaks through my hard head, and I, I discern something much more profound about God that I wouldn't. And so I, I hope that happens today in your observations and your experiences as you, as you bring here. So with that, let's uh, go to the uh, scripture. Fourth chapter, Galatians 1 through 11. I'll read it. What I'm saying is as long as an heir is underage, he is no different from a slave, although he owns the whole estate. The heir is subject to guardians and trustees until the time set by the father. So also, when we were underage, we were in slavery under the elemental spiritual force of the world. But when the set time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law, that we might receive adoption to sonship. Because you are his sons, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, the spirit who calls out, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but God's child. And since you are his child, God made you also an heir. Formerly, when you did not know God, you were slaves to those who by nature were not gods. But now that you know God, or rather are known by God, how is it that you are turning back to those weak and miserable forces? Do you wish to be enslaved by them all over again? You are observing special days and months and seasons and years. 
I fear for you that somehow I have wasted my efforts on you. Okay, let's focus first on the first four verses. What I'm saying is as long as an heir is underage, he is no different from a slave, although he owns the whole estate. Heir is subject to guardians and trustees, so time set by the father. So when we were underage, we were also in slavery under the elemental spiritual force of the world. Now, as Brian, I think, some of you touched on at the last class, which I wasn't here, but I watched. Uh, secession was an important issue among the upper echelons in the Roman world in particular. Um, it was very important in ancient Rome for people of substance to pay, be able to pass on their assets, their legacy, their name. Um, and so they needed ways, if they couldn't produce a male heir, for that to occur. The other factor at the time that we didn't have intensive care units and sophisticated hospitals, and childbirth was a tough thing, and so probably about half the children that grew up would have lost a parent during puberty. So this eye of guardianship would have been something familiar in that society, because a lot of people grew up without one or more of their parents. Adoption was one of the few ways to ensure secession if you didn't have a naturally produced male heir. So um, Roman law developed over time. It wasn't static. So, um, and it's, it's, it's hard for me, I'm not an expert on it, and it's, it's kind of hard to attach sometimes what Paul says directly to what the state of the law is as best we can figure out in Roman times, and there's a lot we don't know about Roman times. But there was this concept of increasing responsibility if you were a child in Rome. We reached puberty, some rights, other rights may not, could have been exercised till 25, and your father, whoever had set the rules, could have some influence over that. So that's kind of the background here of the comparison that he's doing. So that leads me to ask you, is why do you think Paul uses this comparison now, here, of an underage child, heir, and a slave? Any ideas? I've seen three different levels here of the commentators that I've read. All three of them seem to make sense to me and be implied by the text. N.T. Wright views this passage primarily as an Exodus story. That's how he views Galatians in general as an Exodus story, and he views chapter 4, story of Exodus. And so in this perspective, you have the Jews, they have the promise of Abraham, and then they have the, the, the assurances, the promises. Then you have the, in the covenant in Mount Sinai. Um, but they yet have yet not experience fully the freedom and the culmination of those promises and the promised intimacy with God um, because the promises were somewhat vague and the assurances of forgiveness were somewhat general uh, before Jesus, before they were personified in Christ himself. And when I read that comment by Wright, it was interesting to me because when I read a little bit more about Roman estates in wills, secession planning, I saw where that the law was not unlike our current practices, where a will would be uh, typically sealed by a specified number of witnesses, and they would affix their seals to it. And the uh, will was largely a private document, but on the back, there might be a summary of the will. And that's not really too far from, I think, the paper copies of our wills are folded in triparts, and on the back we have something written there, and, and Adam, that probably where it came from, okay? Um, but it's interesting, it wasn't until the person died that the will was open, and the details would have been known. And who got what exactly, how much they got, where it went, and how the executor, the person serving as executor, was going to administer the estate, how it was all going to play out. So when I read that, I said, well, that, you know, you look at the comparison of the Exodus, you know, Abraham, Sinai, vague assurances of forgiveness, and, but none of it, those were the summary on the back of the will, but none of the details were really could have been known until Christ was born. 
So that's, a, to me, a comparison that makes sense. The second comparison you see is generally he wrote this to the Gentiles and mostly in the Galatian church. And so there's a, a sense that he's referencing that people being under a sense of slavery when they are governed by, um, I think the term he uses in this translation, are the elemental spiritual force of the world. And the underlying Greek word for elements, and I may be pronouncing this wrong, is stokeum. Stokeia, stokeum. And that has several levels of meaning. It can mean kind of the elementary building blocks of education, like the alphabet. Our oldest granddaughter starts first grade next year. She will enter elementary school. So elementary education. It can also mean the, uh, the elements of the Greek, of the physical world in ancient Greece that people worshipped and governed their lives, air, water, uh, fire, so forth. And there was a sense in, uh, in the ancient world, in the Greek culture, that these, these types of uh, elements, these weather, the, the, the fortune of, of having children, etc., were governed by spiritual forces and gods. And so people would sacrifice to the God influencing rain if they wanted their crops to grow, or if they wanted to have children, the goddess of fertility, et cetera. So that's the one level. And there's a Greek philosopher, I may pronounce it wrong, Epictetus, Stoic philosopher. And he also said, you know, I think the Bible supports this, that in a way that we are slaves to our desires. And so these elemental forces that govern us are out there and we may worship them, but we're also slaves to what we want, we think we want, our desires. And the example he used that would have been familiar in the day would have been somebody that seeks to have power and authority in their lives and decide the way to do that is to become friends with Caesar. So they, they, they solicit a, a relationship with Caesar and, and they become close to Caesar. And in doing so, he says, ironically, they may gain social status and prestige, but the more they go down that route, the more of a slave they become. Because all of a sudden now they are subject to Caesar's whims. They have to do everything they can to make sure they stay in favor to Caesar, uh, make sure he they would not suffer his displeasure. Everything they do is measured over him. They agonize over their relationship with him. I remember I asked a, um, uh, used to be, to, he's passed away now, somebody that was a, a close White House aide, had an office for a while that opened up into the uh, West Wing, to the president's office. And I asked him one time, I said, who were your best friends that you took from the White House? Who were your best friends in the White House? He looked at me like I was the most naive person in the world. He said, Mark, you don't make friends in the White House. He said, everybody's elbowing everybody else trying to get access to the leader, the president. And, um, you know, it's dog eat dog. And you, you see this, don't you? You read about it. You read all the infighting of presidential aides, the books they write, the fights they have, you know. And so you, we all we all seen that in real life. But finally, on a third level, um, this could be a reference to Christians that kind of revert back voluntarily into a type of slavery uh, instead of uh, uh, experiencing and appropriating, you know, the real joy of their salvation and the relationship with Christ. And that's what Paul talks about in, I think, in the next few verses. So let's go to chapter, let's go to verse 4. But when the set time had fully come, God and his son, born of a woman, born of law, to redeem those under the law, that we might receive adoption to sonship. So God sent his son, born of a woman, naturally, um, born under the law, to redeem those under the law, that we might receive adoption to sonship. Because you are his sons, God sits the spirit of his son into our hearts, the spirit who calls Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but God's child. And since you're his child, God has also made you an heir. So the term here for redeem is the same Greek word used in the third chapter of redemption. And it re means generally to release a slave from his or her owner by paying the slave's full price. 
Um, the slave master, and depending on how you interpret this, the slave masters of law could be these elemental uh, things that govern people, like what we talked about before. But it's this sense of redemption. Um, Adam McLeod, I think, mentioned in the last class that the difference in Greek law, you were born into slavery, and in Roman law, is a product of the law. The law defined you as a slave. Is that right? Yeah. And I'm always thinking back when I hear this story of, of Hosea and Gomer. You know, the first three chapters is that personal story of God tells Hosea to go out and marry this, and what, who God calls an adulterous and promiscuous lady, Gomer. And um, so he marries her, and they have two children, and she falls back. Whatever her addictions are, whatever her problems are, you know, she falls back into her former life, and she gets pulled out again, and she's living with some guy who may own her. She may be trafficking. We really don't know from the text. But, and this, what has to be, from human terms, the most humiliating, demeaning thing, Jose is called to go get her. And he goes and gets her. I mean, this is a lady that's lied to him and, and cheated on him, and it's been a nightmare from day one, and he has to go find her. And he goes to this man that owns her, and he has to pay 17 shekels of silver and a bunch of food stuff to get her back and carry her back home. He, in that sense, redeemed her from the slavery uh, she was in. Um, redeem is also akin to this concept of rescue. If you were in the first class, or the second class, on the first chapter of Galatians, when we talked about God in that summary of the gospel at the beginning of Galatians um, from Paul, and he points out that God sent Christ to rescue us from the evil age. God is a rescuer, and we, the example we use then, if we left this Sunday school class and we go out to the, we, we see somebody drowning in that pond behind here, you know, we're not going to throw them a book on, uh, that teaches them how to swim. We're not going to do that. We're not going to call out, well, you know, tell me, what's your life been up to this point? You know, are you living with somebody? We're not going to ask him. We're not going to ask him. We're going to save him. Save him. And so God is first a rescuer. And that was kind of the point in the first class. And, um, and one of our challenges we talked about is as a church, uh, particularly in this culture, that we cannot confuse that message. We can't condition that message. When we're trying to pull people into an understanding that need to be rescued, that are helpless, you know, we don't need to condition that offer rescue by God with extraneous things. That God is a first a rescuer, and he rescues you knowing exactly who you are, all that you've done. He rescues you where you are. That's message number one. But we know, though, he doesn't leave you at that does it? And, and Paul kind of talks about it, two sides of the, the same coin, and that leads us to um, adoption. When we're rescued, when we're redeemed, we're received into God through verse 5 in adoption. And we mentioned adoption is a, a term that would have been familiar in the Greco-Roman world. It, somebody could actually adopt a servant, uh, interestingly, I understand in Roman world, you could, a slave could get a bequest, but he couldn't enjoy it under Roman law. You had to free him first. Otherwise, it went to his master. You had to free him first, and then he could enjoy his inheritance. You see how two sides of the same coin. You have to be rescued. You have to be redeemed so you can enjoy the inheritance. The two are tied uh, together. That's a metaphor for what Jesus obviously has done for us. So, to understand this, one way of looking at it is to transport yourself to an ancient slave market to appreciate redemption on the one hand, and then to the ancient household without a male heir that they're adopting a son who gets all those privileges on the other. And... Um, some commentators said that it's easy to uh, think of our salvation only in terms of the first, rescue, and not the second, sonship, redemption. And that's a trap, obviously. And what Paul wants to show the Galatians is that you're not only um, rescued, not only removed the curse, 
but he also gives us a blessing. And the best comparison I've seen of this is in the prison context. Uh, you used to spend a lot of time reading about and studying and participating in conversations and listening to people talk about the problem in this country with recidivism. Is that term familiar with you? It's a, it basically measures um, how often and frequent um, individuals commit other crimes or return to prison after they're released. It's a recidivism rate, and people measure that in different ways. Um, but the last statistic I saw was 2015 in the U.S., and that measurement nationally was uh, they estimate that 70, approximately 70% 70 of people that are released from prison will get arrested for something else, major or minor, within five years, 70%. Now, the Alabama Department of Corrections measures it, um, keeps statistics, at least publishes them, uh, based on return to prison. You know, if you get out of prison, a minor arrest is typically not going to send you back. Okay, so you got to be, this is a serious offense to get you back into prison to get in this statistic. But three years out, released from Alabama prison system, about a third of people are going to reenter. Now, um, you know, that probably um, is connected to the, you know, there are a lot of reasons for this. We could talk about them forever. But uh, another statistic that strikes me is this country. We have about 4.5% of the population in the world and estimated to have 21% of the world's prison population in the U.S. I wonder why, you know? wonder why. And I'm not suggesting any one particular, I think we know the ultimate answer here, but I'm not suggesting any of the cultural things necessarily are the main contributor to that. But that's striking. And the example we used to, one of the factors that adds to that that we used to cite a lot in talks was um, the old image in Alabama, which was true uh, 20 or so years ago, that somebody would be released from prison, let's say the end of his sentence. He leaves uh, prison in Atmore, okay? And he's been in a, that, that environment in prison, probably didn't learn anything good, much good while he was there, okay? And he's given... Um, a bus ticket, a uh, donated set of clothes, ill-fitting, seem a mile off probably, and um, uh, uh, between 15 and 20 dollars. And he's put on the bus back to his hometown. And he gets off the bus. Statistically, this person probably didn't have a good support uh, group around him in his old neighborhood. What do you think? And so that money wears out, used up pretty quick. And so it's not much of a surprise that one third of those people, I'm surprised it's not more, end up back in prison after three years. But good comparison here I've read is that with our redemption, our pardon, release from prison, God doesn't leave us there. And he, he asked to imagine that that same person being released prison in Atmore. We take him, we get him a great set of clothes. Okay, a great. We get him Woody Bagwell's closet of clothes. Okay. And um, then we hang the Congressional Medal of Honor around his neck. And we, he's treated like that as somebody who's deserving of the highest awards and accomplishments that this country can give. And that's his lot for the rest of his life. And the suggestion is if we don't, if we can't ponder that example, then we need to think a little bit more about the inheritance, what God has hung around our necks, the inheritance that we've been given in Christ. Now, I know that comparison is bothersome a little bit, and I want to go back to that in the questions, but um, that still isn't the full package, though. We have pardon, redemption. We have sonship. Now, the question I have for you uh, in verse 6, well, first verse 6, Paul says, because you were his son, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts. 
the Spirit who calls out, Abba, Father. Now, am I the only person in this room that's related to some people that I don't necessarily have the closest emotional relationship to? Is there anybody else in here? Maybe it could have been a parent, or maybe it's a sibling, maybe sometimes the children. I mean, am I the only one? Yeah, okay, well, there's at least two people in this room <laughs> that do not have perfect families, okay? But um, the point is, and it's just like Kathy Dupree Stone, she was born as Hank Williams' daughter, but she never met him. She never spoke to him. She didn't even know he, he existed in her life until she was 21, okay? So the sonship, your status as God's son, son was sent to establish that relationship with us. But that's an objective status, isn't it? I mean, you're somebody's son, but you may not feel like God's son. You may not feel like she's your sister because of, through no fault of your own, hopefully, you're estranged. Um, or that person's done all of these things. That's an objective relationship that you may not feel like. The Holy Spirit, though, is entirely different. God sends the Holy Spirit, and he allows you to experience the relationship of being a son. And, uh, and Abba, Abba, the term, is an aromatic term. It is a, almost like a baby's term. It's the most deepest, profound term that you could refer to your father. Um, and, you know, think of that if you, we think of it as a grandmother, we see, we see well, excuse me, our grandparents, we see our granddaughter, and um, if she's pulled away from her mother, our youngest, and then, you know, she starts crying sometimes, and then she goes back and she sees her mother. You know that expression, that spontaneous joy? That's what the term means in terms of relationship uh, with your parents. It's spontaneous. It doesn't require rehearsal. And um, uh, it's, when he talks about calling out Abba, he's talking about prayer life. And I see that in some of you. Uh, those of you, what's the prayer, Novo Prayer Ministry? And that's what that's all about, isn't it? I mean, some, some of you have such an intimate, have fostered such an intimate relationship and with the Holy Spirit, through the Holy Spirit, with the Lord, uh, that you just speak naturally to God. I'm somewhat envious of that. You just speak naturally of him. And like a child who stumps his toe or somebody takes their toy, what's the first thing they're going to yell? Mama! Yeah. That's the other characteristic in times of trouble. Who is the first person that you call to for help? That's the Holy Spirit working in you and allowing you to experience that relationship um, with God. You remember Garrison Keeler? Yeah, the Prairie Home Companion. I'm dating myself. Some of you, I mean, he's dead now, isn't he? No? Still still going? Okay. He's up from your neck of the woods, isn't he? Yeah, he wasn't Yeah, okay. Okay, good. It's all, it's all the same. Okay. Notre Dame. Yeah, okay. Minnesota, whatever. So, um, um, but he would tell this story about his Lutheran church at Lake Wobegon. Okay, and he had a dry minister, he said they never had an altar call, and they, they never, never played just as I am at the end of the service. Yet, they had a guy named Larry Sorensen who would come up about every two months crying, just bucketfuls of tear going up to the front of the service at the end of right when the sermon was over with. And the poor minister would have to hug him <laughs> at the altar rail and, you know, and wipe his tears, saying, are you okay, and, and make sure he could get home well. Um, and Keller said, um, even the fundamentalists in the church got tired of this guy going to the altar rail and asking to be saved, you know? And, um, and I realize in our liturgy, we reaffirm, reclaim our forgiveness, God's forgiveness and grace, et cetera, every Sunday. But there's a sense in, in Keeler's illustration, though, that guy understood the need to be pardoned. I'm not so sure he fully had lived, was living into his relationship as a son of God, right? Because if you don't, you get in that trap. 
what happens. If you're just redeemed and you don't, un, you, you don't recognize the sonship and you don't experience the sonship through the Holy Spirit, you're, just, you're saved out of that pond, uh, but nobody's there, but you're left to your own devices. You're going to have to get saved again and again and again. We know that cycle, don't we? And you're just grinding it out. So, uh, with that, I think I'm going to stop, and I'm going to go to the questions. Okay, on the front and back of your sheet, we've already established that Adam and Mark are the only people with dysfunctional family relationships in this room, so we can get beyond that. But um, beyond that, first question. Has anybody here received a completely unexpected inheritance? You. I'm gonna, don't tell me about the football game again, okay? <laughs> yes, Dave. What? Wow. I never met Mr. Elder. I had his middle name, Eves. Uh, his name was James Eves, and he was a banker in Illinois. Oh, wow. Anybody else? Nobody? Still waiting. Still waiting? Okay. <laughs> well, is any, anybody here, who's here from Ascension way, way, way back? Oh, yeah, y'all are. Okay, you remember a um, curate, Stephen Askew, under Mark Waldo. We had just joined the church. I saw we have a vague memory of him. I remember his child got baptized and, uh, there. But uh, he was there maybe a year we were there, and then he was gone. Okay? Later, John Michael's our rector, and uh, the church gets contacted, and somebody in the church has passed away and left him a nice sum. Yeah, left him a just because he had been... He had been he cared for them at a critical time juncture in their lives. So we had to find him and make sure that he got the money. But my favorite story is an attorney in Birmingham, a friend told us, and he had handled the estate of a guy in Union Springs, Alabama, gentleman, and he had uh, survived his wife, didn't have kids, and he dies. And uh, it's a small funeral, a funeral in one of those pretty old churches in downtown Union Springs, can't remember which one. People attend and uh, leave. And a few weeks later, everybody that attended his funeral got a check. And he had given uh, private instructions and his executor, I want everybody at my funeral to get this, got this amount of money divided. I guess this is a lesson, sign the book. <laughs> yeah. But um, I wish Adam was in, I wish Andrew was in here for that, but sign the book. So. Uh, but everybody got a check. And what a wonderful surprise to everybody. And then, so, you know, I, I thought, you know, maybe we should all go out and add a codicil to our wills and just find that one person that may have done something for us in a unique way that would be the least expecting of something. You know, what a blessing that could be under those circumstances. Okay, next question. Um, being heirs with Christ include, includes enjoying the realities of the promises he has given to us. Can you think of a few of those promises? What are they? Eternal life. Eternal life. Yeah. Anybody else? Peace. Peace. What about a new body? Yeah, yeah that'd be nice. Um, uh, Wiping away the tears from our eyes, that's a promise. Everything bad becomes untrue in a way at the end. Okay? Anything else? Excuse me? He won't leave us. A companion will never be lonely. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Eternal salvation. Excuse me? 
Yeah. Yeah. A meaningful job. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yes. That's unbelievable. That's it. That's, thank you. That's a good segue into the next uh, uh, question. Um, and I, I said we're going to go back to this Congressional Medal of Honor around the prisoner's neck thing. Because I got to tell you, when I read that, that kind of bothered me. I mean, we put people in prison for stolen valor, you know, wearing that. And that's the highest award that people earn for bravery, things they do. And the idea that you would take somebody, maybe the worst person you could imagine in prison, and give him honor like that, that would take it away, in my mind, from somebody else who earned it, doesn't strike me as fair. Am I the only one here that feels that way? No, it kind of bothers you, doesn't it? Even the example bothered me. I saw it in some of your faces. What? And, uh, but, um, you know, in game theory, there's a thing called zero-sum games. Okay? And you know what a zero-sum game is? Uh, rock, scissors, paper is a zero-sum game. One person wins, one person loses. And in economic theory, it's the idea that if I'm going to get an extra dollar out of the economy, somebody else is going to get, or the society as a whole, a dollar less. Zero sum game, okay? And um, zero sum beliefs is a real issue. I mean, a lot of us think that way in one way or another. That's kind of how the stock market works, because people are thinking it's a zero sum game, you know? So, a lot of our economy is fueled by that thinking. But it might be an impediment here to understanding the value of our inheritance in God, do you think? Because, you know, I saw a survey on zero-sum beliefs. They surveyed 1,000 people, U.S., Germany, France. And the, the question was, to what extent do you agree or disagree with the following statement? The more the rich have, the less there is for the poor. Okay? And then they, they did ask other questions to identify the things about the people that answered that. In the U.S., 34% of the people said agreed with that statement. And interestingly, people under 30, it was almost 50%. It was higher for the younger people. There were other characteristics depending on, on other things that you, you went. Um, but if we think, if we view grace our inheritance as a zero-sum game, do you think we have problems? Why? Why? Well, let me ask you, is it a zero-sum game? Yeah, John Kennedy said. Did he say that? Rising tide? 
floats all boats. Yeah. Yeah. But we do have that kind of belief. I mean, people that, in this survey, people that exhibited, in response to other questions, social jealousy, social envy, obviously were much higher on the scale of the zero-sum game. We view, view that. So, going back to the Congressional Medal of Honor idea, applying it to God, there's an infinite amount of honor that he bestows, truly infinite, on all of us. And the vision that we, sh we have that our inheritance is in no way diminished by the qualifications or the, uh, or, or the, uh, of somebody else is important. And I think it's something at least I have to focus my mind on uh, often. Okay, the last question. Uh, we've got several here, but I'm going to ask one more. Um, we can become slaves to our desires, habits, or traditions. To go back to the Stoic philosopher from Greece. Which of the five are you most susceptible to turn to instead of God? I've listed pleasure. Uh, who do you, where, where do you turn when you want to feel good? Attention. Are you more focused on what people think of you than what God thinks of you? Money. Has money replaced your relationship with God? Attention. I've already said attention, haven't I? Control. When you face challenges, worry, stress, do you, you know, do you choose to control or do you rely on God? Or rules. <laughs> do you choose to replace God with rules? What rules make you feel good about yourself? Somebody's got to have a confession here. What, what are you most susceptible to? Pick one. Control. Who said control? Oh. Yeah. Yeah, I get that. Yeah, exactly. In fact, we use that all the time. You're out of control. Yeah. Yeah. Who else? Well, sometimes you don't feel like you have time to wait on God to, uh, to, uh, to act for you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Attention. I'm not getting the recognition I deserve. Pleasure, getting overly excited when Tennessee beats Alabama for the first time in 15 years. <laughs> Anybody else? Okay. Well, I think we're at 12 o'clock. It's time to end. Thank you very much.